Yes, hi, I'm Hanna, and um, I'm from here, Oslo, but I live in Bergen on the West Coast. Love the West Coast. Nature, mountains. I love that people talk really loud. Uh, and of course, I love the business culture. So I've been there for 12 years, and uh, now I work in NetLife as a business designer. This means I work within the field of business and design, and these days working quite much on developing tools for the circular economy. But before I was in NetLife, I was in Innovation Norway. I guess most of you know Innovation Norway. Uh, it's a governmentally owned company providing grants and loans to Norwegian startups and SMEs. That's small and medium-sized enterprise. So Innovation Norway has offices all over Norway and all over the globe. And I was there for 10 years on the West Coast. Uh, so I met quite a lot of innovators from all different niche, from agri-tech, culture, ocean tech, construction, finance. And some of these innovators were students with a Mac, got their idea like yesterday. And some ideas came out of well-established industrial companies within the fjords, who had been there for 150 years. So still, um, there are like quite similar pitfalls they all fall into. And today I have made a list for you uh, with all of these like pitfalls uh, formulated as lessons or advice. But first, um, a thing that happened in my career, because when I uh, entered uh, Innovation Norway, I was this weird design person. I'm an industrial designer, and I was in this financing culture. And my very nice colleagues, they tried to understand me. It's like, what is this thing you designed? And we still all wonder, don't we? Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, it was two separate parts. Until one day, I guess a bit 10 years ago, uh, the sky opened, angels appeared, and uh, the lean startup movement came along. And lean startup really is uh, design mimicry, I think. And I was like, yeah, lean on me. You can come with me. So that was a big moment. And ever since then, business and design has been like happily married. We follow more or less the same process. Good. So now comes the complete list of everything you need to know. Um, maybe most of these lessons or advice apply more to the B2B environment, maybe even in like industrial B2B, because at least on the West Coast, that's where innovation happens. Uh, but I think they're quite general. So in a random order, no like reason why number one is number one, uh, we'll start. Number one, large market potential will not bring you to the market. So I've never met one innovator telling me that there is no market for my product. Because there is a market for everything there is. Pet dental care, mobile scaffolding systems, fish and release. You will find great numbers for all of these different niche. And it's good. You should point out that there is a good, great market. You should even maybe do some calculations, at least if you're in the high volume, low margin kind of business model space. But still, what we want to hear, I think, employees and potential investors, private and public, is your plan on reaching this market, like the map. We want to hear what you're going to do on Thursday in order to get your first customer within this great market. So that's the communication skill you need to have. Number two. Understand the value network you want to be a part of. So quite many innovators tend to focus on the inner life of their innovation. And uh, once I met this subsea company doing quite uh, impressive technical innovation subsea, uh, problem or great thing was it actually eliminated the need for a supply vessel on top. 
seems like a good thing. Problem was that within this value network of different companies trading with each other, quite a lot of them made quite a lot of money on keeping this supply vessel. So this was actually the greatest problem this, company, this uh, group of innovators met, trying to find out how to fit in to this value network. And a good advice would be for you to actually map out this value network in your war room on the wall. You need to like, look at it and try to find out how to fit in. Because you will probably not if you don't do this. Yeah. yeah. Everyone is your customer. And of course, everyone is not your customer, transaction-wise. But everyone is a customer to your idea. And you will never be able to develop a successful product or service if you're not able to sell your ID to almost anyone. This means, like, of course, your family, like employees, investors, public investors, politicians, stakeholders, industrial wizards. And if you're able to sell them your idea, they will give you something back. That be like advice, money, time, resources, access, mobile phone numbers, something, something. And every dialogue is a transaction. And you need to develop different like messages for all of these different people. Create stress. No, we don't want that. Well, um, this is about talking with your customers. And you know that you should be talking with your customers like yesterday. And uh, we all should, all the time. And not once, but several times. And in Innovation Norway, we solved this by gathering a group of innovators in a room. And we made them look each other in their eyes and promise that they would go out there talking to at least 10 potential customers and then gather again two weeks later. And they all did, because no one uh, feared, wanted to fear the... It was like shameful not having done their homework. So they all did. And quite often, they told us that they wished they had done this like eight months earlier. Some of them totally pivoted their idea. One company uh, who was, was developing like a solution for cleaning wastewater in tunnel operations, they went out there talking with their potential customer, didn't find anyone, because no one was responsible for the wastewater, and no one had a budget. And finding someone owning the problem is quite vital if you want to do business. On the other hand, they found quite a few other things they wanted to solve, so good. And we, in Innovation Norway, we always told the companies, do not outsource this activity. Don't let the consultants talk with your customers. Uh, and still, in that life, <laughs> I find myself quite often talking with customers of different... So, uh, well, and I like it, of course, but um, it should be a core activity. And uh, why? Because you actually develop quite a good relation with these potential customers. And you don't want to outsource a relation. Cool. Add an adjective. That's my secret trick. Uh, because uh, I've, uh, you should always narrow down your customer segment, the description of, description of your customer segment. And why is that? It's because if you're an innovator, you have uh, little resources. You should have time and money. So the best way to use your resources when you don't have a lot of resources is to narrow down the customer segment, because that will actually help you find the right channels, the right message, and the right features to develop. And when I uh, once met this innovator, for example, he was developing a life jacket for young adults. And you might think young adults is a narrow version of people. The thing is, uh, what kind of young adults are we talking about? It's like, is it the risk-seeking or the risk-averse? The detail-oriented or the fashion-sensitive? So you could develop four different life jacket ventures for all of these four different segments. And you need to be in different channels, with different message, with different features, with different price. 
So these are quite different things. So that's the add an adjective trick. Try that <laughs> for your customer segment. Yeah. Finding the right person within inside a big company takes time. So uh, one person I met when I showed him this slide once, he was like, yeah, I used three years finding the right person within Siemens of Denmark. Three years. And uh, I've seen companies actually die and get bankrupt just waiting for Equinor. So uh, big companies, they're like big, small nations. <laughs> you can walk and try to find the right person with the right budget for a long time because big organizations can wait. They will wait, and may, sometimes even on purpose, and you cannot wait. So uh, good advice would be to actually go and find someone who is willing to pay you instead of finding the perfect customer. So find out who your customer trusts. This is trust is the basis of sales. And trust is quite often uh, local uh, and historical. At least it's historical. So your potential customers already trust someone else. Uh, and uh, you need to know who they trust. Because maybe, or most likely, you need to piggyback on someone else's trust in the beginning. If you're going abroad, you need to. You cannot sell anything in France unless you sell it th through someone in France, because they don't trust you. And I find that all over Norway, too. People outside Bergen don't trust anyone inside Bergen. Uh, so you need to find out what channels, what their loyal advisor, their industrial paper, their groups on LinkedIn, their meetups, not your meetups. And for example, I don't know what kind of innovations we have in the room, but I guess your customers are not here at Y conference. They're just now at Lillestrøm on the logistics fair or somewhere else. So we need to be where they are, and not expect them to come to us. Bang. Your ambassadors are more important than you. Important thing. So ambass ambassadors are those people inside companies willing to go that extra mile in order to convince their boss or their colleagues to buy your product. They're like, should have a gold thinking, I don't know. And the um, thing is, uh, you need to uh, design kind of that internal meeting where you will never be, because the ambassador is your like, only way inside some kind of budget, quite often. And I've seen great innovation projects emerge because of an ambassador. So they're a great opportunity. And I've seen big innovation projects just vaporize because the ambassador actually quit his job. And that was the only relation they had. Because there are no real relations between organizations. There are relations between people inside organizations. Thing is. So on the personal level, I try to be an ambassador at home. I guess you have too. So I've tried to sell my husband different start things like this fantastic electric vehicle charger. And once I called the company saying, hello, I'm just not able to sell this thing to my husband. You need to provide me with some comparison charts or something. And they were like, no, you shouldn't bother with technical details. And I was like, I don't bother, he does. And uh, we didn't become a customer because they didn't like acknowledge me as an important ambassador. So what does your, uh, do your ambassadors need? They need tools. So they need, of course, a website. You need to make a website for your ambassadors to shine. They need slide decks. They need uh, suggestions for a verbal pitch, actually written down. They need uh, um, videos on YouTube to show how it works. Uh, they maybe even need some printouts just to leave behind on the boss desk, you know. 
Yeah. So they're really important. And don't prevent anyone out there from selling your product. Think of them as members of your team. So, last thing. Uh, uh, this is a, a picture of someone uh, building something while talking. It's a bit blurry. Um, go public early, you have a lot to tell. Uh, quite often, the innovators I met, they, they told me, well, we can't go public because we're not finished. And it's like, of course you're not finished, and you shouldn't go public because you don't have a product or a service, but you should, because you have a lot. You have a history, you have a team, you have a culture, you do things, you have meetings, um, and you're interested in, in a problem, working on a problem, you know things about the problem, that's interesting. So you should like tell the public about this because you need to build your audience while you're building your product. These two building activities should happen at the same time. And the day you're finished with building your product or service, the audience should be waiting for you. You don't have time for building your audience afterwards. Time and money, that's it's all about. Yeah, that was the list. And um, as you see, most of these like lessons or advice don't apply to the product development itself. It's more about uh, uh, sales in the broader context. And that is important, because that's what is missing, and that's what actually Norwegian entrepreneurs are. We are like really good at building products and not that good at selling things. So good luck with your sales activities. <laughs> <laughs>